So is it how do you reach that stage? It's not by delaying benefits or saying, you know, today is a day off, so I'm not going to benefit at all. I'm not going to learn anything at all. And that day becomes two and three and four and weeks. No, it says that my, your idea should be every single day I must learn something new. I must attain something that I did not have before. Learn something new that increases me in iman, increases me in practice. Similar to what? You know, there is no day that's going to pass that you're going to say, today I'm not going to sleep. Today I'm not going to eat. Right? Because you need constantly something to give you energy and to nourish you and to give you a sustenance for tomorrow. You need that all the time. So it's the same thing with learning. Right? It doesn't have to be the same exact book. It doesn't have to be every single day the same exact benefit, you know, the same exact quantity of benefits, hours and hours. But at least every single day you say to yourself, I must have this habit of learning something new and looking for that benefit wherever I can find it. So this book and that book, this sheikh and that sheikh, this lesson and that lesson, that's what your intention is. This is the attraction. So he says, if this is your intention, I want to learn something new every single day and apply it every single day. He says, this is how you'll be able to attain excellence in knowledge because your aim is high uh, and you want to keep learning and you're not satisfied with what you have, but every single day you want to learn something new. And he says, وَطَرِيقُ istifada," And the way that you'll be able to benefit, one way that you'll be able to benefit, and يَكُونَ مَهُ فِي كُلِّ وَقْتٍ مَحْبَرًا He says that every time you will have some ink with you, meaning that you'll have a pen and an ink and paper. You will be able to record whatever benefit you come across. حَتَّى يَكْتُبَ مَا يَسْمَعُ مِنَ الْفَوَائِدِ الْعِلْمِيَةِ So you're attaining a lesson, you're reading a book, meaning that you will have a notebook with you. Today you may say, I don't need it, I have my phone. So a lot of people use their phones to record whatever benefits come across, whether they record the audio or they sit and they write it down. Either way. But he's talking about a time when people needed to have a kind of a notebook with them. So attend any lesson, any lecture, any halaqa. Right? You may hear something that is very beneficial. An ayah and its explanation, its tafsir. A hadith that you'd never heard before or its explanation a really interesting point that opens up um, uh, gates of knowledge for you that were closed before. Answers a question, whatever it is. It says, record it. Uh, be quick to record it because you're going to forget it later. Especially if the source is there. On such and such a night, so and so said, and he gave the reference. Or if you're reading a book. If you're reading a book, you'll read a lot of things in it that if you don't document, you're going to forget later. Right? So how do you retain all of that? It says the way that the scholars used to retain it, even till today, is that they will have a notebook with them. And they will write down benefits. And then later on they will go and they will classify those benefits. So for instance, you know, a benefit according to Aqidah, they may put in a different notebook. Another one in fiqh, a different notebook. Another one in manners, a different notebook. A different, in tafsir, a different notebook. Or at least write it down. So at the end of each book or at the beginning of each book, you'll have a list of all the benefits, all the good points in that book. And later on, you can go and classify them. So it means that if you're a person who is seeking that benefit, always write them down so that you can go back to them. Because if not, you're going to forget them. And one way to remember things is to write them down. Huh? Especially if it's in your own words. You're not just copying what so-and-so has said in the book. Rephrase it. Rephrase it in your own words because that will require that you understand it. That if I, if I say, what did I just say? If you repeat exactly what I said, you remember what I said. But if I tell you, explain it, you need to, uh, first to stop, pause, think about it, understand it, and then bring it in your own words. That means that you understood it. So write it in your own words. That will be better. And he says, مَا حُفِظَ فَرَّ وَمَا كُتِبَ قَرْ He says, whatever you memorize will flee and whatever you write will be stable, will stay. So that means that use the aid of writing things down so that you will remember them and you will never forget them. Memorize, but also write down. And he says, وَقِيلَ And it is said, الْعِلْمُ مَا يُؤْخَذُ مِنْ أَفْوَاهِ الرِّجَالِ He says, knowledge is what is being taken or what you receive from the mouth of scholars, from the mouth of men, he says. لأنهم يحفظون أحسن ما يسمعون because they memorize the best of what they hear 
and they say the best of what they memorize. Meaning that when they speak, they select the best of the best. That was, that's what he's saying. So the, he's telling you the shortcut is that if there is a scholar and a person who is actually established in knowledge and he's sitting and teaching, that would be really the shortcut to knowledge. Why? Because that person will encapsulate and summarize all that he had studied in very simple statements and will deliver that to you. So maybe this benefit, this particular benefit that he had given to you, maybe it took him pages and pages of reading until he could understand that thing on his own. Right? And some matters, some issues are like that. They're really difficult to understand. You can, sometimes you move from one book to the other, from one scholar to the other, until you understand it. Then he comes and he summarizes it to you. So it's very, really quick for you to comprehend it. So he facilitates learning. So that's why he said that, that is, whenever this is a possibility that you have a well-established scholar in that discipline, learn from them because he will summarize years and years of learning to you right there in front of you. And he says, and so and so, he mentions his name, had given his son, son the advice that every day he would memorize something from ilm and from hikmah because though it is little, with time, it will be plenty, right? So even if you say to yourself, you know, okay, it's hard for me to memorize uh, the Qur'an or it's hard for me to memorize Surah Al-Baqarah, you say if you take it, for instance, and I know that ayah is very in length, but if you say if you take one ayah a day, right, which to, to may, maybe many uh, may not be so much, right? Talk about just an average ayah. I'll just memorize that every single day. Well, in a year, you'll find that you've memorized something significant without a lot of effort. So he's saying here that memorize, and this is useful if somebody really says to himself, I don't have time, and also I don't have that discipline and patience. How am I supposed to finish this book? I've never finished a book in my life, unless I was you know, going to be tested on it. Never finished a book in my life. You say, fine, I mean, if you read a page every day, or five pages, or ten pages, whatever you can tolerate without it putting a lot of burden on you. It says, by the end of the month, you seem that actually you finished the book. You thought you could not finish it, you finished that book. Or six months, you finished that book. And you look at it, and you'll say that is an achievement in itself, and that will give you motivation to keep learning. Right? So he says, memorize or read something simple every single day. You just have a plan, it's as simple as that. You can pick a time after Fajr. Remember, we talked about this before, right? After Fajr, before I go to bed, between Maghrib and Isha, just pick one time where you know it's peaceful and you have a clear mind and you have usually the appetite to go and do something and just give yourself 10 minutes and see. And with time and with dedication and consistency, you'll find that you'll be able to do this and of course with dua, right? And he says, and so and so, he says, Islam ibn Yusuf, he says he bought a pen with a dinar so that he could write what he was listening to at this particular moment. Meaning that he paid a lot of money. So يعني, what he's saying is that in one of those times, he was sitting, he didn't have a pen with him. He had heard something and he wanted to document it at that particular moment. So he bought it with a dinar, which is a lot of money for one pen. But he's, why? He says, because it was precious. And he, learning was precious so buying the tools of knowledge so that he doesn't miss out on that and not forget it was also precious. So he says, فَالْعُمْرُ قصير, Our time on this earth is limited. وَالْعِلْمُ كثير, And knowledge is plenty. And there's no limit to it. So that if, in order for you to attain what, what, whatever you can of it, you need to dedicate yourself to it and you need give, to give time to it and you need to be consistent. So he says, uh, the seeker of knowledge shouldn't waste his time shouldn't wait his hours, and will, should seize the nights, and seize his free time. Right? So whenever free time you have, uh, whatever, you know, especially during the night, when it's peaceful, and there's no, not a lot of disturbances, it says seize those moments, because those moments eventually will accumulate to become something important. That is the difference between an ignorant person and a knowledgeable person. A difference between a person who is swimming in doubts and he has no answer to them and a person who has read enough that Allah has saved them from his doubts. He has answers already. Or at least knows the path of how I can escape these doubts. 
by returning back to Allah Azza wa Jal, by asking Him for guidance He has in what He has read and answer already. And that's the difference between the alim or the person who wants and aspires to be alim and the person who is drowning in ignorance. The person who is drowning in ignorance doesn't know how to escape it. But the person who is alim has the tools. If he doesn't know already the answer, at least he knows how to find it. Huh? He knows how to look. And he has the character, he has the knowledge to be able to save him and save those who are around him. He can give good advice and he can also benefit himself as well. So, so and so has said, uh, He said that the night is long, do not shorten it with sleep, and the day is bright, do not sully it with sin. So, meaning that take advantage of your nights so that you can also study in them, and at the same time, uh, do not disobey Allah Azza wa Jal during the day. So seizing the moment, seek, seizing the opportunity to learn, and also taking advantage of a shaykh whenever you find that shaykh so that you can benefit from them. He says, not everything that passes, and if you have an opportunity to sit and learn with someone, don't let it go, because if it goes, it may never come back, like was saying. He says, كم من شيخ كبير أدركته وما استخبرته. He says, how many shaykh, established shaykh or a knowledgeable shaykh, I met him, but he did not learn from him. And so that will remain as a regret. So this is what that second uh, the verse of poetry here, the following verse of poetry. He says, لَهْفًا عَلَى فَوْتِ التَّلَاقِي لَهْفًا He says, I'm, I'm regretting missing that person and not learning from him. So regretting it, regretting it. Not everything that goes away, can come back and be recaptured. So, same thing for days. Same thing for youth. If it goes away, it, you cannot recapture it. And it is, um, you know, it's not important as long as you are young. As long as you are young, you think that you have all the time that you have in the world. You can always make it up. As long as you are free, you think that, oh, I'll be free tomorrow and the day after and so on. As long as you're healthy, you think, I'll be healthy all the time. Until all these ni'mas go away. And then you'll recognize how important they are. So he says, if you have them, and if you don't believe that, ask someone who's older. And he'll tell you that he was as healthy as you are, if you are young. He'll tell you, as I was as healthy as you are, as carefree as you are, uh, as you know, whatever as you are. Huh? But now I'm not. Now I'm not as healthy. Now I have a lot of distractions. Now I don't have time. So I was just like you. And everybody was just like you, and you'll become like everybody else who's older than you. So it's not mystery. The path is the same path. So take advantage of it before it goes away. And the following advice from Ali ibn Abi Talib uh, anhu, is important. He says, إِذَا كُنْتَ فِي أَمْرٍ فَكُنْ فِيهِ He says, if you're doing something, then do it. If you're concentrating, doing something, engaged in it, occupied by it, then concentrate. Don't be distracted by something else. Concentrate in doing this thing. And it's enough disgrace and loss that you would turn away from the knowledge that Allah Azza wa has sent down. And seek Allah's protection from it day and night. So the first part of the advice here is important. He says, if you are in an issue, in a matter, just focus on it. Meaning that if you are in a halaqa and you're listening to it, Listen, why did you come? Right? I'm not, I didn't come here to text somebody else, right? So if you're serious, if you came in a halaqa because you want to learn, then sit and learn and focus. There'll be another time to do other things, but don't mix them up. If you're in a book, right? And there is this shahwa sometimes. You start a book. You get tired a little bit in the, in the, in the, in the middle. And you want to just close that book, skip it and go to something else. And then once you start a second book, you get tired. And before you finish it, before you get the full knowledge, you get tired, you want to move to something else. And so is that human being. Is what? Bored easily. So he says, if you are focused on something, do it. Dedicate. Finish it. And once you finish it, move on to something else. Don't be so easily distracted. Huh? Temperamental, meaning I, I like this, I'm going to do it. No, I hate it, now I want to do something else. No, acquire focus in your life and finish the task. 
Then he says, turning away from the religion of Allah, turning away from the knowledge that Allah had sent down, is a great loss. If Allah had given you that opportunity and you turn away from it, you know that you have lost a lot. So ask Allah to protect you from that. And that is a nice reminder to keep in mind that if Allah Azza wa had given you a gift, whatever that gift may be, appreciate it by ask Allah, asking Allah to keep it safe and to help you appreciate it and allow it not to go away, whatever that gift may be. So especially if you have, so you notice in yourself, subhanAllah, that now in this week or this month, I started reading and I am consistent and I'm, you know, um, learning a lot from it. Or I started learning something Islamic and I'm learning a lot from it. Ask Allah Azza wa to keep that ni'mah and not take it away. And don't do something that will take that ni'mah away from you. Because it is a ni'mah and if it continues, you will see its effect. Then he says, وَلَبُدَّ لِطَالِبِ الْعِلْمِ مِنْ تَحَمُّ لِلْمَشَقَّةِ وَالْمَذَلَّةِ فِي طَالَبِ الْعِلْمِ He says, the seeker of knowledge has to endure burden and be humble in seeking knowledge. Mashaqqa, that there is burden in it and we talked about it, right? It's not always sweet, it's not always easy. But this is the test between those who are serious and those who are not, those who are ready to carry it and those who are not. And by the way, any profession in the world that you're going to um, occupy, you want to uh, adopt, any type of profession will have a hurdle and a burden in it before you'll be able to call yourself this or call yourself that. When you want to be a teacher, when you want to be a lawyer, when you want to be this, you want to be that, even blue collar, right? Blue collar um, jobs, whatever it is, there's always that test that you need to overcome, to prove yourself. And there's always a burden with whatever you want to do in this, in this dunya. So knowledge also has this test in it and has a little bit of burden. But if you are patient with it, you'll receive Allah's gifts as a result. So it's not always easy. And we talked about this. It's not always easy to say, I want to come to the masjid. I want to sit. I want to open a book. I want to listen to a lecture. And sometimes your iman is high and you really want to do it. And sometimes your iman is low and you don't feel like doing it. But you need to persevere and be patient with all of that and keep pushing yourself. Understand that you need understanding that you need balance in your life. But you need to push yourself because without pushing yourself and without dedication, you won't be able to get much from it. So he says, you have to be able to bear that burden and you must also be humble. And then he says about التملق. التملق مذموم إلا في طلب العلم Meaning um, being tolerant and flattering of people because you're going to have teachers and uh, scholars who you would have to be patient with to be able to attain or benefit from them. You're going to have colleagues and you have to be patient with them uh, and uh, forgiving to be able to keep their company. But as long as they are on the path of knowledge, you need to do that. And eventually you'll be able to get maximum benefit from it. So even if your teacher at times uh, may, may be in a bad mood, uh, you need to tolerate that. Uh, your teacher sometimes uh, is not going to explain things very well. They're going to shout at you. He's going to call you stupid. Or what? Still, he's saying, what? As your teacher, you need to be patient with all of this because he's a human being after all, right? So on his part, on the teacher's part, he needs to adopt the best of manners. But he says on the student's part, he says you need to be patient with all of this because your purpose is what? Is to attain ilm. So sometimes there is that hurdle in it. It's not always going to be sweet. It's not always going to be easy. But if you are patient, you're going to get it, inshallah. The next chapter, and this is uh, also a beautiful one and an important one. He says, فَصْلٌ فِي الْوَرَعِ فِي حَالَةِ التَّعَلُّمْ This is in wara'. Wara' is staying away from the haram, avoiding the haram, avoiding the suspicious. It says, while seeking knowledge, you need to maintain a state of wara' where you are away from haram, avoiding it. And he says, why is that? He says, فَكُلَّمَا كَانَ طَالِبُ الْعِلْمِ أَوْرَعَ كَانَ عِلْمُهُ أَنْفَعُ وَالتَّعَلُّمُ لَهُ أَيْسَرُ وَفَوَائِدُهُ أَكْثَرُ He says, the more that you stay away from the haram while you are learning, that knowledge is going to benefit you more. 
And now learning will be easier for you, and you will get more benefits from it. Right? And he's going to quote, uh, it's not here, or it's going to come. Yeah, it's going to come. Oh, it's going to come in the second chapter. Anyway, so because sin it doesn't mix with the gift of knowledge. Sin doesn't mix very well with learning the Qur'an. It doesn't mix very well with learning the hadith. It doesn't mix very well with learning Islam in general. So he says, the purpose of learning is what? What we said. What is the purpose of learning? Remember? You know that, right? What is, why, why do we learn everything that we're learning? To increase your taqwa, right? So that you can take it and put it into action. Of course, you want to know Allah Azza wa Jal. But there's a consequence to knowing Allah, which is that you want to put it into action. Now, if your actions are devoid of taqwa, it means that whatever you are learning is not benefiting you. It's not being put into practice. So there is here an aborted part of knowledge, right? A missing part of knowledge. And that missing part means that you have not really learned it well. Because there is a complete circle to knowledge. Right? There's a complete circle. When you learn something, just here internally, when you learn something and you understand it, and then you start applying it, that application will teach you something about it that you did not know before. So the benefit of anything, the benefit of the Qur'an, the benefit of salah, the benefit of fasting, the benefit of hajj. So if you did not go to hajj, and you learn everything about hajj, this is how you perform it, this, 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 this. Just by reading a book, did you learn everything about hajj? No. By reading everything about salah, did you actually learn everything about the salah? No. Because even if you say, oh, a salah forbids evil, you learn that. But you're not really going to learn it until you pray and you're dedicated in your salah and you find out how it forbids evil. Then you will know. Then your knowledge have now rise to a level that just theoretical knowledge or book knowledge could not have given you. So that's not ilm until you apply it. Ilm is not ilm until you apply it. So you're not going to be given ilm until you stay away from the haram. But if you're committing the haram and learning, committing the haram and learning, is saying learning for you is going to be difficult. Because there's going to be an obstacle there. You've given the shaitan authority over your life with the sin that you're given. And you need to fight him to be able to learn. So how could you be fight him while also at the same time you're giving him power over your life? So learning itself is going to be difficult. Understanding is going to be difficult. And you're not benefiting with that knowledge. So that knowledge needs to be taken and needs to be applied. And here we are talking about wara'. Wara' meaning staying away from, away from the haram. And there's a level evil beyond that. Okay, and that level is staying away from what is ambiguous or suspicious, suspicious matters. But the first step is staying away from the haram. And there's more, inshallah, that's going to come. He says, وَمِنَ الْوَرَعِ الْكَامِلِ Now he's going to talk about extra wara', extra wara', right? And يَتَحَرَّزَ عَنِ الشَّبَعِ That a person does not overeat, okay? So why? This is, he says, from the adab. This is from adab, right? To stay away from what hinders Seeking knowledge. He does not overeat. He does not oversleep. He does not overtalk. So why all of that? Because it contradicts clarity. It contradicts your energy if you want to really learn. What happens when you overeat? You get tired. Okay? You, don't, you, you can't study. You can't remember. Okay? And when you get tired, what do you want to do? When you, when you overeat and you get tired, what do you feel like doing then? Just sleeping. Right? So you have no energy to do anything useful. So he says, and you avoid oversleeping. Because if you oversleep, you wake up and you're still tired. And you begin to develop it as a habit. I have to sleep so many hours in a day. So you're wasting so many hours. And one of the things that have barakah and he will talk about is that Rasulullah wasallam said that there is barakah in waking up early. Al-Bukur, waking up early has barakah in it. So you are of the habit, and how many people have that habit? To stay up at night. Okay, stay up at night, till what? What time? One o'clock, two o'clock, three o'clock. Maybe some people up to Fajr. 
And then you get to sleep. Uh, you miss the bukur completely. Bukur is after fajr. So you miss that blessed time. So the time where you're supposed to be sleeping actually is at night. You've turned it into day. And the day, time when you're supposed to be awake, which is the day you turned it into night. And you missed out the time of barakah. So that's not how it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be what? That unless you are worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal after Isha, what are you supposed to do? Go to bed. And the Prophet ﷺ would hate talking after Isha unless there is something, right? Unless, you know, it's an act of worship. But it's like it's hated to talk after Isha. That is why? Because you're supposed to go to sleep, right? I know I understand that from next week Isha is going to be 6.30, right? <laughs> right? So yeah, of course, moderately. We're talking about moderately, right? Isha, and then you have to, maybe your lunch is after, whatever you need to stay. But you don't stay up way too late. That's what we're talking about. Not up way too late. That is going to what? Hinder or obstruct you waking up for Fajr and then obstruct you from taking advantage of that blessed time after Fajr. So Al-Bakur is a blessed time. So he says, Kathratun Nawm, avoid oversleeping and also over-talking. Because that's also a distraction and it corrupts the heart. So it's a distraction and it corrupts the heart. How does it corrupt the heart? Why is over-talking corrupting to the heart? Why? Because if you over-talk, what happens? You'll make mistakes. The more that you talk, the more that you're going to make a mistake. Guaranteed, right? Either you're going to be lying or you're gossiping about somebody else, or making fun of somebody else, or getting in a fight with somebody, that's what happens when you over-talk. If you're selective, yes. But if you're not, and you just keep babbling, babbling, you're going to say something that you're going to regret, you're going to say something that is useful, so that's distracting to the heart, and takes you into valleys and corners that you don't want to go to. And then he says, وَأَنْ يَتَحَرَّزَ عَنْ أَكْلِ طُعَامِ السُّوقِ إِنْ أَمْكَنْ So he's here talking about like that full wara. He says, and he doesn't eat in the marketplace and the, buy food from the marketplace. That is his recommendation. Why is that? He says, because it's أَبْعَدُ عَنْ ذِكْرِ اللَّهِ وَأَقْرَبُ إِلَى الْغَفْلَةِ Because it's more distant from the remembrance of Allah Azza wa Jalla and closer to heedlessness. So he's talking about a state of wara where the person is really focused really focus and does not want to be distracted. So of course, if he goes out to eat, what, ha- what happens? If you go out to eat, even today, right? You go out to eat, for instance, and you go into a restaurant or you go into whatever, right? And you're uh, buying food. What happens is that, you know, whether you know, you don't want it, you're not seeking it, but you're going to see something wrong, right? You're going to hear something wrong. So that's what he's talking about. He's like, with that person who is really focused and he wants to learn and he want to guard his eyes and guard his ears and guard his tongue. He says, don't go and buy food from outside because of this sin that might be involved in it. That not, he's not saying necessarily that it is haram. Uh, because you're not going there seeking these things. But avoiding them is always what? Better. Right? Avoiding it is always better. And he says also because, many that's not very relevant because he says the poor may see you buying stuff like that and they cannot buy it and so that they may envy it so there is no barakah in it. That's a possibility. I don't know if this is very applicable today. But he says that yes, uh, buying food from outside could have those shortcomings in it. Wallahu alam. And then he mentions a story here uh, just about, uh, just confirming uh, you know, not, not purchasing food from outside but eating home cooked food which is Anyway, always better whenever that is possible. But he says, you know, that is why the scholars of, of, uh, of past used to have so much wara' and so much delicate wara' that Allah Azza wa Jal blessed their work and blessed their output, their knowledge output. And, you know, someone like Imam al-Nawawi, but everybody else, they wouldn't lie, they wouldn't eat anything that is, has the hint of haram in it. They've guarded... Um, their stomachs, they guarded their eyes, they guarded their ears completely. And so they were pure, as pure as you can get as a human, but they were pure enough that when they spoke, there was ikhlas in whatever they were saying. When they wrote, there was barakah in whatever they were saying. So what they said lasted. So you want to seek the barakah, and maybe you know why is there's less barakah today in things that we say and things that we learn, is because we really are ourselves polluted. So if you purify yourself, a little bit of knowledge will be enough. Okay? 
And how many times have we heard the same reminders in Jum'a, 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 right? Or in halaqas. And it's the same thing and we've memorized it, but we've never applied it. And it never made a dent. Right? We never really changed. This is why is that? It says because that self, the heart, is not ready to accept it. The heart is actually fighting with it. I know it, but internally I'm fighting with it. I don't want to do it. Whereas for the people of past, and we, may, we still have some today, alhamdulillah, but a people of past in particular, they would hear, hear one advice and that will change them. Why is that? So a little bit of knowledge for them was a lot. But for us, a lot today is very little because we don't apply it. So this is the state of wara. Staying away from the haram will keep your heart alive. And if your heart is alive, you hear one ayah, you'll follow it. You hear one hadith and you will follow it. And that's the real benefit of knowledge. And also he says, and to stay away from backbiting. And to stay away from uh, uh, keeping the company of those who over talk. And he says, because people who do that, they will just steal your minutes and hours away from you. And just waste your time. So of course, avoiding backbiting. And avoiding backbiting in particular when it is uh, disguised as religious Right? Disguised as religious. And sometimes this is what happens. What about Sheikh so and so? What about the student of knowledge so and so? What is it? What about the fight between this this da'iyah and that da'iyah? And you talk about it, and it has the appearance of being religious because we're talking about religious things. But the purpose is not learning. The purpose is what you're curious about the fight. Just like uh, what happened with sister so and so who's fighting with sister so and so. That's exactly the same thing. Huh? So I'm interested if, I'm, if I'm interested in domestic uh, disputes, I'm really only interested in the fight. I'm not going to get anything from it. I'm just curious about who fought with who and what happened to them. Human curiosity. And if it's the same when it happens between scholars, I'm just interested in of the fight. And I'm not really learning anything from it. So if this is not beneficial, and this really advice, I hope that you can keep in mind if you're a person who had been exposed to this. If this issue between this scholar and that scholar who are fighting, this is not going to benefit you, leave it. Uh, you're not a judge. You're not the judge, first of all. And it's not going to help you. So, why are you interested? Okay, leave it. And if you say the issue is confusing, well, I mean, learn enough to reach a level where that issue is no longer confusing to you. Right? Right? You follow what I'm saying? Then learn enough, right? You can, if I'm at, at a basic stage and those scholars are arguing about something that is advanced, you're not going to understand it anyway. You'd be more confused. And you listen to so-and-so and you'll be thinking, oh, he's right, all the other so-and-so, or maybe he is right. It says leave this all together and learn enough. And then either one of two things will happen. Either by the time that you learn enough, they'll resolve that thing. You don't need to worry about it. Or if it's not already resolved, you'll learn enough that you'll be able yourself to decide so and so was right and so and so was wrong. But don't follow, don't follow the trend. The trend is to talk about this or to trend or to condemn this person or condemn that person. And once we finish with them, we move to another group of people and we talk about those and so on and so on. So if that is what knowledge to some people is, okay, know that this is really not the company that you should keep. Leave that and actually learn something that's going to benefit you. And he says, and amin al wara also from wara avoiding the haram is to uh, avoid uh, people of corruption, you know, people of vice, uh, and to keep the company of the pious, because of course this is going to affect you, whether good or bad, it is going to affect you. And he says, and when he sits, he sits facing the qibla, following the sunnah of the Prophet, and wa yakunu mustanna, and he follows the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. وَيَغْتَنِمْ دَعْوَةَ أَهْلِ الْخَيْرِ And he will seize upon the supplication of the pious. وَيَتَحَرَّزْ عَنْ دَعْوَةِ الْمَظْلُومِينَ And he would avoid at all cost the uh, supplication of the oppressed. Meaning that he never hurts somebody to give them the chance to raise their hands and make dua against you. So if there is any opportunity for you to, if you had hurt somebody, to go and seek forgiveness from them, you do this. Right? Because otherwise, if they make dua, the dua of the mazloom is accepted. If someone is oppressed and they make a dua, that's accepted. He says, so save yourself from this. So don't hurt 
anyone. وَيَغْتَنِمْ دَعْوَةَ أَهْلِ الْخَيْرِ And you seek or seize the supplication of the pious. Not necessarily by you going and saying, so and so make dua for me, so and so making dua for me, but being in their company, being in their midst. Right? Because in that way, you will gain their dua. They will make dua for you as you are making dua for them. يَجْلِسْ مُسْتَقْبِي الْقِبْلَةِ One of the sunnas, and it's only a sunnah, but one of the sunnas that if you really want to learn, find where the qibla is and sit facing the qibla whenever that is possible, easy, and appropriate you know, for, for you to do. Because the Prophet ﷺ praised that direction, the direction of the qibla. So that also is a sunnah. And in general, follow the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And he says the seeker of knowledge should never look down on uh, and forsake the manners and the sunnah. So even though we're talking and we're saying it's just a sunnah, no, it is a sunnah. So don't look down on it and ignore it. If it's adab, don't look on, down on it and ignore it. Because he says, if you ignore that, you're gonna, if you ignore the adab, you're going to ignore the sunnah. If you ignore the sunnah, you're going to ignore the obligations. So it's not a circle, right? So this adab and the sunnah are protection for the fara'id. So if you are able to break this circle, you're going to break eventually the circle of what? The obligations themselves. So keep yourself always with what? Protected. And don't ask, right? One of the, one, one of the adab when it comes to what Allah has said, whatever the Prophet ﷺ has said, is before an application, don't ask, is this sunnah or an obligation? But rather you try to do it. And only ask whether it's a sunnah or obligation when you cannot. When you cannot. Or if you have to teach somebody. But otherwise, don't say to yourself, well, just simply a sunnah. Or the, some scholars have said it's a sunnah. And some scholars have said it's an obligation. So if already in your mind, it's already demoted to a sunnah. You follow? So, for instance, the Prophet ﷺ, let's say, has prohibited, in a statement, has prohibited something. Some scholars have said it's haram. Some scholars have said, no, it's only disliked. So when you read about that disagreement, in your mind you say, well, it could only be disliked. So you start doing it. Because in your mind it's what? Only disliked. But then you have to remind yourself of two things. One, but other scholars have said what? It's haram. So you could be doing haram. So why not avoid all of this and avoid it? Whenever possible, if it's easy, just simply avoid it. Plus, the Prophet ﷺ himself said, do not do this. Right? Shouldn't you out of respect not do it? Even if it turns out eventually that it's just simply disliked. So out of adab you avoid it. So here, you know, you should not ignore anything that Allah Azza and His Prophet ﷺ either has commanded or has prohibited. By saying, well, it's only adab or it's only disliked. Avoid it. If he had prohibited it to the best of your ability and do it to the best of your ability if uh, it is commanded. Right? And he says, and he should pray a lot and really pray with khushu' because this will help him. Right? Salah will help, will help in everything. So one of the things you know that we mentioned before is that if a person is going through any difficulty, one of the sunnahs of the Prophet ﷺ is to engage in salah, is to pray, start praying, which is something that we don't remember. So you just received bad news, or you're going through some bad, you know, moments, some, some bad days, right? And you don't know what to do, and how to get out of it, how to overcome that feeling. One of the things that will help is to pray. Okay? So you seek, you know, a place that is quiet, where you are by yourself, where you can concentrate, and you start praying. And you pray a lengthy, contemplative prayer. This is how Allah Azza wa Jal will aid you and help you. You need guidance, and you don't know where guidance is going to come from. You need an answer, or you're anxious, you don't know how to overcome that. Engage in salah, and again, lengthy, contemplative salah, and you will find that the aid of Allah Azza wa Jal will soon arrive. Soon alive, at least internally. Internally, Allah Azza wa will stabilize your heart. And Allah Azza wa will open your eyes. And will give you insight and wisdom. And then later on, maybe something else. Maybe Allah will give you a strength to be able to solve it. 
where you did not think that you had that strength before. Change your mood where you thought that nothing could change it. But Allah Azza wa could change it because Allah controls everything. So he says, and also in seeking knowledge, if you find it to be difficult, if you find it to be um, uh, understanding things or pursuing them, any difficulty in it, he says also seek salah because salah will assist you bi'awnillah Azza wa Jal. And then he says that these uh, verses of poetry, Kunil Awamiri wa Nawahi Hafidah. He says, observe the commands and then also the prohibitions of Allah Azza wa Jal and observe the salah on time. وَطْلُبْ عُلُومَ الشَّرْعِ وَجْهَدْ وَاسْتَعِنْ بِالطَّيِّبَاتِ And says, and seek the knowledge of the sharia and be diligent. وَاسْتَعِنْ بِالطَّيِّبَاتِ And seek the aid of what Allah has allowed, meaning the halal, and avoid the haram. And you will be a faqih, a faqih who, had, who memorizes and who, and who has knowledge. وَسَلْ إِلَهِ وَسَلْ إِلَهَ كَحِفْضَ حِفْضِكَ رَاغِبَ And ask Allah Azza wa Jal to stabilize whatever you have memorized, meaning always believe and know that Allah Azza wa Jal is with you and that Allah Azza wa Jal is the one who is enabling you to do all of this. Naam. And the end of this chapter, he says, let me see, أَطِيعُ وَجِدُّ وَلَا تَكْسِلُ يعني something like, uh, okay, they will read that. So he says, obey Allah Azza wa Jal and be determined and diligent and do not be lazy and know that you are going to be returning to Allah Azza wa Jal وَلَا تَهْجَعُ and do not sleep. Or we can say, do not oversleep. Because he says, the best of creation, قَلِيلًا مِنَ اللَّيْلِ مَا يَهْجَعُونَ They would sleep little at night. And that's an ayah. كَانُوا قَلِيلًا مِنَ اللَّيْلِ مَا يَهْجَعُونَ وَبِالْأَسْحَارِ هُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ So he says in the beginning of it, Obey Allah Azza wa Jalla and be dedicated, okay, in pursuing knowledge. And don't be lazy. Right? Don't be lazy. You say, well, how, how can I not be lazy? He says, by asking Allah to help you. Now, taking the physical means for you not to be lazy, the things that we talked about, one, not overeating, not oversleeping. Sometimes, you know, things, one thing that he does not mention, exercise. Exercise is also one thing that's going to give you energy. So to be physically active will also inject energy into your life. So also do that as well. So it doesn't mean that you're learning that you ignore your body. No. So you eat well, a balanced diet, a healthy diet, and he'll be talking about that. And then also exercising. So don't be lazy and ask Allah. Ask Allah, you know, to keep you dedicated, to, get, to uh, uh, maintain your energy, and also that you don't forget about the value of what you are doing. Because as long as you remember the benefit of what you're doing, you will continue doing it. And know, وَأَنْتُمْ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكُمْ تُرْجَعُونَ And know that you're going to be returning back to Allah Azza wa Jal. So every single day that you're spending, actually, in reality, every single day that you're spending learning something, if it's for Allah, that is something that a day that you're going to see when you meet Allah Azza wa will be for you and not against you. And every day that you waste or you use to sin against Allah Azza wa is a day that is against you. So if you keep in mind that you are going to die, you say, let me before I die do what? Get as much as I can in this life, from this life, for the hereafter. Let me get as much of it as possible. So, to, you know, imagine if somebody comes and tells you, you know, you're going to die in a month. Or you're going to die, and there are people actually like that. You're going to die in a month. You're going to die, you know, unexpectedly. Unexpectedly. You go to the doctor, and there are people like that in your city. You are going to die unexpectedly. And every single day when he or she, they wake up, they don't know if tomorrow is going to be another day or not. So, okay, so if you have today, and you don't know that you have tomorrow, if you have today, what are you going to do with today that will be able to help you when you meet Allah Azza wa Jal? So you say, okay, let me do something that actually will help me. Learn something new, do something new, help someone. So this is how you take advantage of your life. By believing that, Death is near. وَأَنَّكُمْ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكُمْ تُرْجَعُونَ this, Yes, I am going to die one of those days. And he says, and don't oversleep because the best of creation, they used to sleep little at night. And this is the description as we said in the Qur'an, when Allah Azza wa was talking about those that he appraised, كَانُوا قَلِيلًا مِنَ اللَّيْلِ مَا يَهَجَعُونَ They would sleep little at night. وَبِالْأَسْحَارِ هُمْ يَسْتَغْفِرُونَ And the time of sahar, which is the last part of the night, they'd ask Allah Azza wa for forgiveness. So, 
your night should be a night of sleep but also a night of worship and that worship could be worship you could divide it and make it a worship in salah a worship in salah and reading of the quran or worship in salah and seeking knowledge in general that also is worship and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam you know his habit so that you'll understand if you want to divide up your night how to do it the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would sleep half of the night then wake up and pray one third and then sleep one sixth and wake up for fajr so this is the entire night so whatever configuration right you want to do for yourself that works for you i'm working i have to do this and i have to do that adjust it but know that this was the practice of rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam half of the night he's asleep then he wakes up and he prays one third of the night and then once he's done with that he would sleep the letter you know to sort of take you know a nap before fajr time and then he would wake up for fajr pray those two rak'ahs of fajr the sunnah and then fajr and then get out because they did not sleep after fajr right so you could follow if your schedule and your uh, work permits that you can follow that pattern right so they did not sleep after fajr because they would sleep at the qailula time right dhuhr time that's the time when they would sleep and take a nap that's not available to you that's fine adjust your schedule but you would give your night uh, a time for sleep where you could rest and also some time for ibadah and maybe also some time for seeking knowledge so that every single day you're doing something that brings you closer to Allah azza wa jal fasl fi ma yurithu al and this is one of the things we're going to be talking about what is a thing that is going to increase your power of memorization how could you memorize better so he's going to have some advice here. Aqwa asbab al You know, with the, the thing that is going to uh, really enable you to memorize. Al-jiddu wa muadaba To be continuous and diligent. Consistent, right? So every single day, you're memorizing and you're learning. You're memorizing and you're learning. And never giving up. He says, this is a thing that's going to help. He says, wa taqlilu al And not eating a lot. We talked about that. So not eating a lot. Eating imbalanced meal but not overeating right layli and praying at night wa qira'atul qur'an min asbab al hifz so reading the quran and night prayer so all this is what ibadah all this is ibadah so reading of the quran will sharpen your mind and keep you connected to the words of allah azza wa so of course when the words of allah enter your mind enter your tongue uh, and you know on your tongue enter your body your ears listen to that you must believe that they will have an effect on your entire body that they're going to reshape your whole body so reading the quran is something else so of course they're going to endow you with abilities and allah, allah azza wa will bless you because of it so he says one of them is memorization that will enhance your memorization salatul layl where you will be able to ask Allah Azza wa Jal, right, to give you power and then to improve whatever abilities you have to continue learning and not eating a lot. We talked about that. And he says, you know, لَيْسَ شَيْءٌ أَزِيدُ لِلْحِفْظِ مِنْ قِرَاءَةِ الْقُرْآنِ نَظَرَ He says, there's nothing that is going to help more to memorize or enhance your power of memorization than reading the Qur'an, especially from the Mus'haf itself. And there is here a saying from the Prophet ﷺ, the one who would love to, the one who would be pleased to love Allah Azza wa Jal, let him read in the Mus'haf. So there's a virtue to reading in the Mus'haf. Of course, if you are a person who had memorized the Quran, you can just read the, read the Quran from memory, right? Just, as, just for you to review whatever you have said. But if you um, want to kind of, let's say, read the Qur'an, you're not a person who's reviewing his memorization, and you want to read the Qur'an, they say, Wallahu a'lam, that reading the Qur'an from the Mus'haf is better than from memory. And the reason, they say, is because more of your body is engaged. More of your body is engaged in the process. You follow what I'm saying? That is, your eyes are also. Huh? Your eyes are also. It's not only your tongue, not only your ears, but also your eyes are involved in reading from the Mus'haf. So they say, everything else being equal, you know, reading from the Mus'haf is better. But if you need to review what you have memorized, then review what you have memorized in whatever way is best for you. That will keep it in your mind, inshallah. And here he says that two verses of poetry that we've mentioned early on, Shikautu ila waki'in su'a hifdi, attributed to a Shafi'i that he complained to Waki' about his inability to memorize at one point in his life. And so Waki' told him, leave and stay away from every sin. Because if you stay away from every sin, 
Allah Azza wa will grant you that ability to understand his religion and to be able to memorize it. So consider sin to be an obstacle in every direction. Every, every pursuit that you have, if you sin, that sin is going to be an obstacle in it. Even rizq itself, even rizq itself, sin will be an obstacle in receiving rizq. Okay? So it's always an obstacle. So if you want to remove obstacles from your path, whether we're talking about even worldly matters, but religious matters and worldly matters, stay away from sin. Okay? Yani, there is a part of a hadith, you know, that part is weak. And a person will be denied provisions because of a sin that he commits. So that part of the hadith is weak. But what testifies to that meaning are ayahs in the Quran where if you obey Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah will increase His bounties upon you. Right? So minus that obedience, you're not going to receive those blessings. So that testifies to the meaning of that hadith is that yes, if you disobey Allah Azza wa Jal, then there was a decrease in barakah. So you want to see barakah in your children? What do you do? You and your children stay away from your haram. If you want to see a barakah in your marriage, what do you do? Stay away from the haram. You know, you want to get engaged, you want to get married, what do you do? You want Allah to bless that union. It's not, not a union yet. What do you do? Stay away from the haram. You want to learn Islam. I want to learn it well and understand it. What do you do? Stay away from the haram. Right? So the haram will steal away the barakah from your life. All of it. In religious and in worldly matters as well. So that's why he said, what is going to enhance your memorization and your ability to retain he says, staying away from the haram. And then he says, was siwaku wa shurbul asal. Also, siwak and uh, eating honey. He says that also will enhance your memory. And he does, by the way, in this uh, in this chapter, uh, talk about other things. And this will enhance your memory. This, 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 and this, you know, will uh, uh, worsen your memory. Da 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 da. But none of the. I mean. And the Sheikh Ra'izahullah Khair, you know, the editor, Sheikh Bashir, you know, uh, have omitted a lot of these things because there's really no evidence for them. But it's just based on experiment or hearsay. If you eat this, this will happen to you. If you eat this, this will happen to you. But what he has retained here, it was what is the most beneficial. So in general, if Allah Azza wa had praised or mentioned uh, a food in the Quran or a food is mentioned in the Sunnah and is praised, it is a very, very good idea for you to make it part of your diet. Right? A very good idea. So if we're talking about honey, talking about olive oil, talking about anything that is praised by Allah or His Prophet وسلم, it's a very good idea to make it part of your diet. He says, وَأَمَّا مَا يُورِثُ النِّسْيَانُ What brings on forgetfulness, فَهُوَ الْمَعَاصِي وَكَثْرَةُ الذُّنُوبِ So he says sin. And, 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 and uh, having plenty of sins. وَالْهُمُومُ وَالْأَحْزَانُ Having a lot of stress and sadness because of the dunya. And also, وَكَثْرَةُ الْإِشْتِغَاءِ الْأَشْغَالِ وَالْعَلَائِقِ So being occupied with it and having a lot of attachments, worldly attachments. So the first part here, he's right. He says, if you are overly anxious about this world, كَثْرَةُ الذنوب, no, الْهُمُومُ وَالْأَحْزَانِ So sadness and anxiety. He says, if you are a person who's uh, bothered with a lot of, you know, uh, past, you know, mistakes and regrets and you always are thinking about it so you're sad because of it uh, or anxieties about the future or about something that is happening at this moment if you're constantly thinking about the dunya and down because of it he says you won't have the energy to study and the energy to learn and the, and the patience to continue because you're being straddled by all of this pain he says you don't need all of this you need to Drive this away. You need to get rid of that and not be so attached to the dunya. And if you have a lot of ashgal and alaiq, you're busy in this dunya with this and this and this, and you are you know, attached to this and you attached to that, it says that also will you know, suck all your time and leave little for you to be able to concentrate and to be able to learn. So yes, you're going to need to learn. I'm sorry, you're going to need to work in this life and you're going to need to earn a living and you have your academic pursuits and all of this or that. He says, but you, when you're done, you know, just concentrate on what Allah Azza wa wants and leave matters of the dunya to Allah Azza wa If you're worried about something, give it to Allah. If you're sad about something, give it to Allah Azza wa 
and concentrate on really what benefits you and try to decrease your attachments to this life. Because as he has said previously, the dunya is not that significant for you to be so sad over it or worried about it. Whatever, you have been, whatever you've lost, you can find again. And whatever you are worried about hasn't happened yet, so you don't need to worry about it. It may never happen. And if it happens, Allah Azza wa Jal will assist you. So it's not going to be as bad as you think it's going to be. So no need for you to be sad and no need for you to be worried. Leave the dunya. It is so insignificant in Allah's eyes. And focus on what Allah considers to be the most important thing, which is the hereafter. Focus on the hereafter. And Allah Azza wa Jal will drive away the concern of the dunya from your heart. But if the concern of the dunya is in the heart, it's hard for you to care about or even have the mood to even hear about anything about the hereafter or anything that is religious. And he says, he, he, this is what he says, it, that the wise person, the intelligent, shouldn't care about uh, worldly matters so much because it hurts you and it doesn't benefit you. Uh, and humumu dunya, worldly uh, uh, distresses and worldly pain, brings darkness to the heart. And if you always are thinking about this painful thing, this painful thing, it just fills the heart with gloom. And, um, and, and you don't have a space in it, right? As I said, you don't even have the mood to do anything else. Not any hope that your situation is going to change. And you basically are, you have given up. Given up on this dunya and maybe given up on the akhirah. So this is what this breeds. So you cannot really... We're not worry about the dunya as much, but whereas if you worry about the akhirah, it brings light to the heart. Because the worry about the akhirah will motivate you to do something. So you'll start worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal. And that anxiety will be filled or replaced with peace and tranquility. So in the beginning, yes, you be be worried about hellfire, but when you start worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal, you'll feel its sweetness. And so it will bring peace to you. The worries of the dini, on the other hand, they don't bring any type of peace or satisfaction. So the worries of the akhirah are beneficial. The worries of the dunya are not. قال, he says, you will see the consequence and the trace of your hem in the salah. So if your hem, you're worried about the hereafter, that will affect your salah. You'll be praying better and getting a lot more from your salah. If you're worried about the dunya, how does it affect your salah? Hmm? You, don't, you don't concentrate, right? You don't, you don't, sometimes you don't even want to pray. You don't even want to pray. And if you pray, your mind is not there. You forget how many rakahs because you're thinking about something else. So he says it just brings darkness to your mind and darkness to your heart. So why should you do this to yourself? Allah can solve this. So remember always that that matters or the pain of the dunya, Allah said, you don't worry about it, I'll take care of it. Pain of the dunya, Allah said, don't worry about it, I'll take care of it. You worry about the akhirah. Okay? You worry about the akhirah. And the path to Allah's you know, forgiveness and mercy is easy. Okay? It's easy in the sense of what you just ask Allah Azza wa for forgiveness and He'll forgive you. Ask for assistance and He will assess, assist you. Yes, you'll be tested. But as long as you come back to Allah Azza wa Jal, you'll always win. So the path of the akhirah is not that difficult. But the path of the dunya is very difficult because when Allah is now with you, you're on your own. And on your own, you're defeated all the time. The shaitan is against you and you're defeated all the time. So keep that in mind that you don't need that darkness into your life. Focus on the akhirah and again, balance. It's not like focus on the akhirah, neglect your wife or neglect your kids or neglect your parents. Oh, we need your help, we need some money. No, I'm focused on the akhirah. That's not balance. Okay? Everyone has their right. Okay, yourself has a right upon you, your parents have rights upon you, your spouse has rights upon you. You need to give everybody their right. Your children have rights upon you. Everybody has his right. You can't just sacrifice one's right because of somebody else. You can't say, I'll be learning the Quran and neglecting all of you because of it. That, that's, you've, you've sacrificed something that Allah had commanded you not to, and you'll be questioned. On Allah Azza wa Jalla, right? So, forget about the worries of the dunya and worry about the akhirah, right? Now, 
فهم الدنيا يمنعه من الخيرات وهم الأخيرة يحمله عليه so they know worries, uh, uh, worries about the dunya will stop you from doing good worries about the akhirah will actually will propel you to do something good and he says and praying with khushur وتحصيل العلم praying with khushur and attaining knowledge that will drive away sadness that's amazing subhanallah if you actually think about it you do, why are you sad? Okay, a lot of time we are sad because sometimes really, or a lot of times, we have a lot of time to think about matters that make us sad. You have free time, right? And so the shaitan takes advantage of it and tries to destroy you because of that thing, because you're just your mind and nothing to occupy it. So it keeps wandering. Okay, and it usually gravitates towards pain of the past or the anxieties of the future. What happens here and what's going to happen then? So he says, instead of this, if you fill your time with something that is useful, especially something meaningful, that's going to drive away these thoughts and those occupations and sadness in general. And you will feel better. Subhanallah. You will feel better about your life and you'll feel better about whatever, right? You know, the future and the present and the past. The more that you see, I've done something good. I've attained something good. So... One of the ways of pushing away sadness is learn the Quran, understand it, learn the hadith, understand it, learn this deen, understand it, and you'll feel that you've gained something, and yes, something meaningful that will help me uh, in the future, bi'ithnillah. And he says, Naam. So he says uh, two verses of poetry. Uh, someone is speaking to himself, and he says, O Nasr ibn Hassan, seek the assistance, meaning the, of Allah, and everything that you want to keep and every knowledge that you want to retain. This is the thing that's going to drive away sadness. And everything else is falsehood that cannot be trusted. And nothing else is going to drive away sadness unless if you really learn. And you really learn something specially from the Quran and from the Sunnah pertaining to your situation, and that would be the best. You're going to find yourself as if you're flying. Huh? Because of, a, of happiness because you've learned something new significant and it's talking to you it's speaking to your problem and you know, subhanallah that would be the most marvelous thing but it requires patience right it requires believing that the, the answer is here the answer is there in the book of Allah keep reading it and you will find the answer to the thing that is troubling you and when you find it it's as if you really literally find, find a treasure nothing will be more precious to you and you'll start having a relationship with the book of Allah Azza wa unlike any other because it's now based on experience. Not hearing somebody telling you read the Quran. No. You read it and you found something special. You. And that had become now a moment between you and Allah Azza wa that you cannot deny. And you can always go back to and say, I was looking for something and Allah gave me the answer in his book. So that is the type of relationship that you will have with this knowledge. So you really want to drive away sadness, let drive away sadness with learning whatever Allah Azza wa Jal has, has revealed. And then, you know, and then the last, you know, uh, four verses of poetry, he's basically saying that, um, uh, addressing in the first uh, two verses, uh, so and so, this beautiful woman who is this beautiful and that beautiful and all of that. But in the last two verses he says, but he says, but leave me and excuse me or pardon me because I am fascinated and obsessed not with you, but with seeking knowledge. Okay? And in seeking uh, excellence and knowledge and taqwa is sufficient from trying to listen or to see beautiful women. And that is true too, right? So he's saying that the one who reaches a point where he starts finding actual joy in learning and benefit in learning, stops finding that much joy in haram. What, what attracts us to haram? The pleasure that we find in it. And there is pleasure in it. I'm not going to lie to anybody and say, oh, there is no pleasure in haram. If there is no pleasure in it, no one would go after it, right? But with that pleasure, there is what? A lot of bitterness and a lot of pain. As soon as you do it, when you're done, what do you feel? If the heart is still alive, what do you feel? Regret, you're disgusted with yourself. Why did I do this, right? Am I stupid? Why? I'm never going to do it as long as the heart is alive, right? Why did I do it? 
I shouldn't do it. And you're going to feel down and you're going to feel tired and you're going to feel bored and you're going to feel miserable. Huh? And that all is the effect of sin. So, yes, there is joy, but it's always mixed with bitterness and hardship. But the joy of ilm, in the beginning there is hardship, not bitterness, but there is a little bit hardship. When you overcome that hardship, you'll find its joy. And when you find that joy over there, it will be a better substitute for any joy that you can find in the haram. Like literally, seriously. Seriously. And if you tell yourself or you ask yourself, it was a question that we ask ourselves at times. He says, okay, and I'm trying to do the right thing. But it's hard. And I'm finding myself a lot of times um, sad and struggling with this and that. And whereas I find those who are sinning, living, living, uh, living a life that is not uh, observant of Allah, not conscious of Allah, they're always happy and they're always smiling and they're always having fun. Why is that? Right? Why is that? I'm not finding this sweetness, but it seems that they're having fun, but I'm not. It says, because you exist at a level where you have not reached the sweetness of that life yet. You're still struggling at the surface. So you need to push yourself harder. Huh? You're going back and forth between you and that, that previous life, and you're still looking at it. And you haven't found that yet, the sweetness of iman. That is going to allow you to drown in the love of Allah Azza wa Jal, in the love of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and really, really, truly enjoy it. So keep pushing, and you're going to find it. And ask Allah Azza wa Jal for it. And don't think that those who, uh, I don't know, record themselves and take pictures of themselves or proclaim that they're happy, sinning against Allah Azza wa Jal, are really, seriously happy. They're not, right? There is an aura, there is a facade, there is an appearance of happiness. But on the inside, no single human being escapes stress and worry and anxiety and self-doubt. No single human being, no matter how rich or poor they are. Right? And especially if you are away from Allah Azza wa Jal, it starts accumulating, accumulating and accumulating until it reaches a point, the breaking point. But you keep pushing. And you will find the pleasure that Allah Azza wa talked about and His Prophet وسلم, had mentioned. So we have one more chapter and I'm wondering if I should continue or we can leave this till next week. Uh, what brings on provisions, what stops it, what increases one's uh, life and what decreases it. So it's not very long. So we can leave this till next week so we can finish it and then start with the next book. And as I mentioned, inshallah, the following book, uh, which we'll start inshallah next week, is Min Adabul Islam. And uh, it's available in the bookstore in both the Arabic and the English translation. So you can get that inshallah from it either before Isha or after Isha inshallah. So let's leave a little bit of time to see if there are any questions. And if not, we can stop. So um, you can get ready for Isha inshallah. Um, yeah, and th so that I don't rush uh, covering the second chapter, the last, last chapter, and to give you enough time, inshallah, for it. So, yeah. What is it? I'm sorry, what? Uh, so, in Arabic, it's called Min Adabul Islam, Min Adabil Islam, and in English, it's called Islam.